you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we continue to unravel the mysteries behind the origins, motives, and cultures of the seven fallen houses in the world of darkness. This episode will focus on the House of the Dawn, the Devils. All of God's angels were created equally, but some were more equal than others. You know where he got that line from. Some were created to rule and later deceive. Some would be heralds of the Lord's rules and then manipulate those around them to their own systems. You sense a little pattern here, don't you, little lamb? They would help, then they control. They were the first to be created and then the first to fall. They are the house of Namaru the devils. They are the most charismatic and manipulative of the fallen, yet are the ones who struggle the most to fit in with the mortals and other demons. They are the first house of angels created by God and are the house of the morning star. Naturally, they are drawn to those humans who have great vision and tiny penises, sorry, towering ambition, similar to those Ventral folk of your camembert chamomile or whatever your fucking towering faction is called. You know, politicians, executives, CEOs, and other dregs of your society. They are once heroes fallen to their vices, and many are drawn to those sorts of humans too. Whether it's an old cop that beats the shit out of inmates, a protective mother, anyway, before the fall, they, the Namaru, were God's heralds, enforcing his name and standard across the heavens. Their name does mean something in your tongue, you know. Namaru is the ancient Akkadian language word meaning to shine. Naturally, an ego, I mean, the memory of former nobility, is something that each devil struggles with. They were the perfect princes and princesses little boys and girls would dream about. They were the greatest of God's creations, yet they have now on earth is a shallow, hollow mockery of their former greatness. The abyss has made them feel shame and regret, feelings they never thought they would feel before, feelings they would never naturally express. If it, It's a clusterfuck of emotions, really, little lad something you won't ever get to experience. I understand you are a real mutt of vampiric creation. In any case, with such conflicting emotions from the devils, they're also known to draw acts of foolish bravery and quizzicotic courage, which can be seen as synonyms for ambition to the desperate devil. Devils, however, are not anguished appearing and are very much like to be in control of the flow of conversation and master to subterfuge and all that shit. Their laws aid with this. The law of the Celestials allows the Namru to carry the divine will to other houses, to strain from their efforts and direct them. They could even take over their evocations completely if they thought it necessary. This is the law that allows the Namru to commune with the powers of faith as well as their fellow Elohim. Those who have this as their primary law assume the visage of Bel, the visage of the Celestials. The Bel are magnificent winged beings that possess a commanding presence akin to that of a prince or princess. They use their appearance as a source of inspiration and sometimes intimidation. However, if they succumb to torment, their beauty transforms into a grotesque form with red scales, horns, and leathery wings. You can kind of see where the devil bit comes in. A high torment bell lacks the control over their form is reflected in their natural weapons. In heaven, those who wore the visage of bell led the angels and oversaw faith. The bell were responsible for managing projects, leading armies, and enforcing discipline on behalf of God. Many preferred to take on immaterial forms like light and sound, which carried over when they were forced into more material visages during the world's downfall. The law of radiance enables the Namaru to command and inspire humanity. It functions similar to the law of humanity, but it is more reliant on the devil's inborn charisma, as well as their original roles as the heralds of mankind's collective glory and leaders of the fallen hordes. Quingu, the visage of radiance, is the apocalyptic form of those who specialize in the law of radiance. The Quingu are striking and majestic beings with radiant wings and piercing eyes. However, when consumed by torment, their beauty transforms into a cold and cruel alien appearance, complete with horns and acid-spitting abilities. When they are not as prone to becoming ruthless monsters as Avro Namaru forms, they relentlessly push humans towards destruction. 
The Quingu's abilities and appearance were not present until after the rebellion, leading many faithful heralds such as Michael to view them as lesser and perverted versions of their own abilities and duties. The Quingu used their powers to inspire humans similar to the more powerful counterparts, the Bell. During the War of Wrath, the Quingu were valued for their natural ability to determine true rebels over loyalist angels. They also made excellent tacticians and record keepers. Finally, and perhaps oddly within the context of everything I have shared with you so far, is the Law of Flame. In case it wasn't obvious, which knowing you it probably isn't, the Law of Flame allows the Namaru to create and control flames, both in a purely material and mystical sense. Those who have this as their primary law assume Nusku, the visage of fire. The Nusku are surrounded by flames that appear half illusory and embody of the magnificence of fire. They possess eyes that shine like the sun and emit a tangible aura of heat whilst also being immune to fire damage. Nusku personalities are fueled by the intensity of their chosen visage, leaving little room for compromise and displaying fanatical devotion to any cause they embrace. When plagued by high torment, Nusku become like sullen embers, treacherous like lava with thin crust of cool rock, really nasty shit. Their personalities become withdrawn, only flaring up when experienced Experiencing emotional peaks, so to speak. Surprisingly, despite their destructive powers, the Nusku display great versatility in their creative capabilities. They are credited with the creation of the stars, the sun, and lighting, even though the actual control of these objects passed to the Nebiru and the Lamasu. The Nusku also played a role in kindling the fires of faith in humans and teaching them to harness the powers of fire during the rebellion. These ingredients made the heralds creatures of courage and nobility filled with love for the humans. However, it is the qualities God gave them that would lead them to their downfall, but don't tell them us of that. God was too pure to shape the abyss into his likeliness, though you could argue it was laziness on an omnipotent scale. He created his heralds to erect, don't laugh, a barrier between him and the abyss that would serve as his agents, messengers, and the heralds of their namesake. They were their own stars, but one of them was the brightest one of them all. Lucifer. You know, I didn't think I needed to say that, but okay, whatever. Both he and the rest of the house would communicate with God directly as the rest of us wondered why we lesser Elohim existed. And I do not need to say this to underplay our potency, but the heralds were created to be better than us. Our then fragile bodies would have been destroyed by God's presence and his words. Through Lucifer, we were tasked with the creation of the universe and the heralds would lead and supervise us. Touching the abyss that we would sculpt into creation would have contaminated them, changing them, sullying them with imperfection. If they were corrupt, so too would be the divine plan of God. The only input they had was telling us what to do, strengthening the will and evocation of the fellow Elohim. They established the hierarchy and no one questioned it. Why would it? This is just how things were and we just obeyed. The Herald would continue to watch as the other six houses created in God's image, filled with love for their creation. With the manifestation of Adam and Eve, the Heralds found their moment, their reason to exist. This was that moment that would define their existence. They would follow God's addict of love in humanity. But the second part, never revealing themselves, brought something new to the Heralds. Fear and uncertainty. Why would God keep the angels, more importantly, the Heralds, from humanity? They never had to hide their magnificence before, why should they start now? Did God not trust them, and by extension the rest of the Elohim? Was God displeased with our work, and by extension the command of the Heralds, the leaders? The Heralds were the perfect creations, and these theories brought doubt and made them question everything as their whole existence came crashing down on them. As they watched the primitive humans learn with difficulty, building excess amounts of frustration, the Heralds decided that God was wrong, and that was the beginning of the end for us all. With the visions of Aramel, the great debate was in a standoff until Lucifer, first of all the Elohim, stepped forward and proposed the idea that in order to love the humans, we had to disobey God, that it was required of us. 
His comments came from a place of unlimited love for humanity, but also with pride, a vice that lies in the heart of every single Namahu. For Lucifer, however, it was warranted. The history of the Namaru in many ways is the history of Lucifer. For a house of pride, none are as proud as he. For a house of leaders, none had his individualism or heroism, the glory of which would shine across all of creation. It would only be after the fall that the rest of the devils would step out out of his shadow to shape their own destinies. Make note of this, this was the first time that they fell. Now, with all that vomit-inducing dribble aside, the Morning Star inspired us all. We acted with pride, but compassion too. The supposedly flawless heralds turned their backs on God and were condemned as devils, creatures so reviled that they were deemed beneath the contempt of the Creator, unworthy of not just his love, but his his notice. Lucifer would create the legions and his Namaru, Kel Asuf, would create the law of humanity in response to the Cain's murder of Abel, which disturbed the devils most of all, at least according to them. It also damaged them as many began to practice more diabolical practices, to pardon the pun. Many Namaru began to embrace their sin as Cain did his own, as humanity, as well as God, had ignored them and all of his his teachings. I heard once that this left Lucifer weeping like a baby. In a sense, this was the second time that they fell. Lucifer would endure all of this for a millennia before claim control over some of the legions and devil fought devil in what would be known as the Long March, on the battlefield as well as the debating halls. He would take control, making one final attempt for his kin to listen to his words, only focusing on governing them rather than guiding. There is a difference. However, the sinful devils were not creatures of honour or glory, but tyranny and corruption. This is how they would truly rule little lamb. The morphing of government and figures of authority of your world stems from the teachings of the Namaru via the Watchers. Ten of the chosen of Lucifer we have spoken of before. They taught the secrets of creation, including the sun for which they were for a time. Now you know the origins of their flame. Many suspect it was the Namaru themselves too caught up in their Machiavellian scheming to let Lucifer's plans fall through that ruined the grand experiment whilst some suspect that Lucifer was still butthurt to use your interesting phrasing by the punishment of God and wanted his forgiveness. But the demons that raped with mortals, spawned the Nephilim, angered Lucifer, slew the abominations, the damage of both of these fiends returning us all to a similar place of humanity, playing with sticks and stones and the Elohim on the battlefield. But Lucifer would fall, as he would all, the devils for the third and final time. Whilst many of us wept and were terrified, every Namaru was frustratingly resolute, a proud warrior to the very end. Lucifer did not join them as we discussed before. He was chained up as a crude joke from God. They, his house, believed he would be imprisoned with them. He was not, and when this piece of news reached the devils, the politics and the questing of their nobility continued. They would pursue power for their own sake, to dominate, not lead. They did this for two reasons, to reject Lucifer, for whom many saw as a traitor, but to satisfy the corruption in their souls, to satiate the terrible pain and loneliness that a lifetime in hell can simulate. Warriors and rulers became power mongers and betrayers, beings of deception which was really the only thing left for us all in hell. Then hell cracked, then we were free. The Namaru were horrified by the state of humanity which, to be terribly blunt, is obsessed with the shallow pursuit of immediate gratification. At the same time, it pleased them as many are willing to accept anything for a bit of material wealth, whatever that meant to them. It was possible to make them do anything with the allure of a promise of something better. Humans want to believe the lies, to become one with fantasy, and that is before including our laws. Many also have the benefit of being bloody rich and naturally got a good head start when we all escaped the abyss. They may be the most numerous to escape, but they weren't the most powerful, at least in strength alone. Their financial gain did grant them some dominance over us. What would complicate things is that some is that within the souls of many, many found the long forgotten emotions of honour which made them wish to return to their former glory. Just as many were fixated on genocide, of course, but we were all beings of variety and more than so than others. 
I feel a little lamb that it goes without saying most devils are Luciferians, one of the factions we govern. They still follow the vision and dream of Lucifer, hoping that he is out there, somewhere, wanting to crush the hopes and dreams of the creator, using humanity and other demons as their manipulated vessels. Many are drawn to the Faustian faction, getting a buzz off of mortal worship, not for their love or rather genuine love. Namamu Faustians wish to build their own little empire on Earth, first amongst equals. Some devils become cryptics to try and work out where their Lucifer went and why, learning the truth about the Fall, their mentor, and the true course of their damnation. Of course, there are some in the Reconciler faction, still in love with humanity and hope to rebuild Eden and earn God's forgiveness, as well as the forgiveness and love of humanity. Few Namaru Raveners exist, thank goodness. They are nihilists, overcome with doubt and regret, fed up with the fruits of their mistakes, stare and laugh at them. Most are too arrogant to admit that the rebellion was a mistake, and few in the house would question Lucifer's actions. I'm no Namaru, so I have full authority to say he was a fucking naive prick. Namaru make for perfect cult leader personalities which makes the harvesting of faith a fairly simple operation for them as well as the obtaining of fools. It's a high priority for many devils, which can easily take many forms, from a new age religion or one of those stupid tech bro crypto schemes both are easy to recruit new members from. So you see little lamb, what they offer now in this new world is nothing new. Anyone lead, but obedience is not easy for the devils to obtain. Give the humans what they want and they will lap up all that sweet cream up like the good kittens they are, but if you give them milk, they suddenly lose interest. We all manage fine without their judging gaze and those who realise this truth relish in it. For the devils, this pisses them off big time. You would have thought that many Nami would come together and make it harder for us to escape their slippery gaze, but they don't trust each other. Eons of political backstabbing and manipulation does that to you, you know, which I'm sure you know about, little lamb. The House of the Dawn has always been ambitious and do hold a large monopoly over us as well as the humans. They are the ultimate deceivers and with words of poison that taste like honey, but they struggle more so than the other houses. They are complex, contradictory souls filled with trauma like all of us. Some are kind, though some are just cunts. Some need the forgiveness of God, whilst others wish to be the monsters you grew up believing them to be. For them to work efficiently, they have to worm their way into societies and embrace the fact that no one needs them anymore. They were the paladins of hell, puppeteers of a lost heaven and self-proclaimed heroes of a world that didn't want them. Tragic perhaps, but incredibly arrogant. If they do not change their ways, they'll fall for a fourth and final time. To be kept updated, follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.